Praise the Lord. What a day. After all that rain, so awesome. You know, it amazes me every time. I mean, you know, we started meeting outside the last uh, Sunday in May, and here it is. You know, we've almost been completely around the horn one time or around the sun. And we've met inside once. Let me just say that uh, I kind of like it out here. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, let's not, uh, you know, uh, be afraid to meet inside when the time comes if the rain drives us in. Amen. All right. Um, wow, how about that? God has been refining this message uh, <clears throat> for the last couple of days, and then this morning it really took a, a shift, and uh, I see now that I'm uh, missing half of my notes, and so, you know, instead of being, uh, you know, a full two-hour sermon, it's it's going to be <laughs> it's going to be whittled down. But uh, praise the Lord. You know, um, we are in covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's what uh, I want to talk about today. Um, as I dug back into this, you know, I'm just uh, amazed at the depth and the wonder of God's majesty, His plan, and His provision for us through His covenants. His covenants. If you've never studied the eight covenants of the Bible, I encourage you to do so. Today we're going to focus on the new covenant, which is, of course, through the blood of Jesus. Jesus said when he introduced the Lord's Supper at the, uh, his final Passover, he lifted up the, the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And he said, this cup is the new covenant of, in my blood. Now we know that covenants were, were always, uh, you know, sealed with, with blood. And we know that, uh, that, that that is a, a, a sign of life, you know, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so uh, when we look at the covenants, we see that they are uh, ratified with blood. And, um, of course, the blood of the new covenant was Jesus' blood. Um, when they cut covenant in the Old Testament, it was with an animal, and they would cut the animal in half, you know, bilaterally, and put one half on one side and one on the other, sometimes several sacrifices. And then the people that were agreeing to the covenant would walk through the covenant, uh, walk through the, the severed body of the animals, saying that this is a serious deal. We're making this agreement. A covenant is, is an agreement. It's a treaty. It's a compact. And uh, if we look at these covenants in detail, as I mentioned, there's eight of them, and, and uh, they are just filled with gems, gemstones that you can find out for yourself. I encourage you, if you don't know about the covenants of the Bible or you feel a little bit of shaky as you're understanding, um, I was going to help you uh, <laughs> understand them more, but I think this is God's plan because it, there's just, uh, it's, it's so deep and and, and wide. We sing a song, you know, deep and wide, deep and wide. There's a fountain flowing deep and wide, you know, and, and that is God Almighty. God is, is, is so deep and uh, wonderful, and His Word contains uh, a, that depth. But uh, I want to refer you to ariel.org, A-R-I-E-L, another uh, name for God's uh, chosen people, A R I E L dot, dot O R G. Go there and uh, look at their discipleship program, which is entitled "Come and See." 
Now, when Jesus first presented himself to the, uh, the disciples along the Sea of Galilee, you know, uh, uh, you know, it says that Nathaniel saw him and, and recognized him as the Messiah. And then he told the other guys, come and see. Come and see who this guy is. We found the Messiah. Come and see. And so go to ariel.org and go to come and see. And there are about 78 or 80 studies that if you want to grow in, in the, the knowledge of God and, and his truth, go there and you will find the study, the eight covenants of the Bible. Okay. But what I want to, us to uh, focus on today that is the new covenant, amen? Um, and that is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. So we're going to read Jeremiah 31, 31. That's an easy one to remember when, you're, you, when you want to look at the, the new covenant. Uh, just remember Jeremiah 31, 31. It's tricky with the sun, you know, and, and uh, my eyes are sensitive. But I've got to be able to see what I'm reading, right? Okay. Isaiah 31, beginning in verse 31. Lord, we thank you for your word. And, uh, Lord, we lift up your word to us this morning. We lift up our hearts to you. And we invite your Holy Spirit to uh, speak to us, soften our hearts, and, and uh, open our spiritual ears and eyes to hear and, and see all that you have for us. In Jesus' name I pray. The New Covenant, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So here we see that God is making a promising a new covenant with the nation of Israel, both, uh, both tribes, Judah and Israel. He's making a covenant with them that he will fulfill and that he will uh, do as he said he would. Um, in Isaiah 59, turn to Isaiah 59, verse 21, just to, uh, you know, Isaiah has a lot to say about this covenant, but we're just going to be read one of the uh, scriptures. Isaiah 59, 21. Isaiah 59, 21 reads, As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, the nation of Israel. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord from this time and forevermore. If you want to check out more references that support the new covenant being made with the nation of Israel, look at Isaiah 61, verses 8 and 9, or Isaiah 53, verse 3. That's Isaiah 61, verses 8 and 9, and Isaiah 53, 3. Um, so now we're going to flip over to the New Testament, and we're going to look at Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 25. So if you have your Bibles, turn over to Romans Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and then comes Romans. Romans, verse 11, uh, chapter 11, beginning in verse, uh, verse um, 25. Romans 11, verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, 
that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Verse 29, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. When God makes a covenant with his people, it cannot be revoked. It cannot be turned around. It is irrevocable. For as you were once disobedience to God, he's speaking to us as the Gentiles, as you, for you as were once disobedient to God, yet now you have obtained mercy through their disobedience, the Jewish nation. Even so, these also have been disobedient, that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. You know that one of the reasons for you to be alive is to be a testimony of God's mercy in your life and to speak of the Jewish Messiah as your own Messiah and as your Savior. When you do that, it says the heart of the Jewish person will become jealous and go, how come you know this stuff? Well, because I read from your Torah. I understand, you know, what what God's plan is. And then it says this in uh, chapter 11 of Romans. Even so, these also have been now been disobedient that through the mercy shown to you, they, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. God blinded the eyes of the nation of Israel so that we could experience the mercy of the covenant relationship that he intended for his people. And then verse 34, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Anybody here been counseling God recently? Or who has first given to him or, and who, it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory to God forever. Hallelujah. Oh, the, the depth and the riches and the majesty of God and his plan to be able to blind the eyes of the Jewish leaders so that we could have our eyes open. It says there in that passage, God committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. That includes us. We, through the grace of God and the blood of Messiah, become partakers of Israel's blessings. You remember in the Abrahamic covenant when God called Abraham out of his tent to look at the stars? And he says, and I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse those that curse you, and all nations shall be blessed because of you. What was he talking about? All nations shall be blessed because of you, Abraham, because of your obedience to your belief. It says Abraham believed and it was counted unto him as righteousness. All nations would be blessed through Abraham, through the Davidic covenant, and through the lineage of the Jewish nations. Jesus was a Jew. Yeshua, his Hebrew name. Jesus came to his own people, the Jewish nation, but his own did not receive him. They rejected him. All part of the plan. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. And so, we become partakers of this blessing made to Abraham through the Abrahamic covenant and uh, fulfilled in the new covenant that all nations would be blessed through Messiah. We are partakers of the salvation that will come to the nation of Israel. We read it. It says that they will all come 
to a knowledge of Christ. And during the tribulation, and that's what it's going to take, it's going to take this hard, these hard things to happen. Did you know that the Bible teaches that two-thirds of the nation of Israel today, which is estimated at maybe 15 million people, there's about five, five and a half, maybe six million living in Israel today, but worldwide, the diaspora, 15 million, two-thirds of them will perish in the tribulation. One-third will remain, and one-third God is going to pour out His Spirit. They will recognize the one whom they have pierced, and they will repent as a nation. Just as a nation, they rejected the Messiah. They will repent, as Anita taught, repentance. That's what God is looking for in our hearts and in the heart of the nation of Israel. It will happen to fulfill God's promise in the new covenant. Now, we need to read two scriptures in order to make the connection between us as believers today, tying in with the new covenant promise to Israel. Ephesians 2, verse 11. Let's turn to Ephesians 2, verse 11. Ephesians 2, verse 11 tells us this. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Hallelujah. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. He reconciles us through the cross, Jew and Gentile alike, through the cross, therefore, thereby putting to death the enmity. What was the covenant that was in effect before the new covenant? The law, the Mosaic law, the covenant with Moses. And uh, according to that Mosaic covenant, the, the Ten Commandments being the foundational uh, part of that, is that we needed to hear what God said and obey it. And the reality was is that no one was ever able to do it. No one could fully obey God in everything that he commanded. Even those, those Pharisees and the scribes who thought that they were holier than thou, you know? Uh, no. If you, Jesus taught that if you failed in one of those commandments, you failed in all of them. There's no one that has perfectly fulfilled all of the Ten Commandments except for Yeshua, the Messiah. And he fulfilled it and initiated the new covenant so that by faith in him, we could enter in, whether Jew or Gentile. God, God made a way through the blood of his son. The other scripture I want you to look at is in Ephesians also, chapter 3. We just looked at Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 16. Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 5. Which in other ages was not known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And so we become partakers of the blessings of the covenants of God with Israel, including the new covenant, through the blood of Christ. This is God's plan. He's made a way for us through the blood of Jesus to receive all the brace, uh, blessings promised 
to the nation of Israel through the Abrahamic blessing and, and uh, like that. Okay, so I have a question for you this morning. Are you in covenant relationship through the blood of Jesus, through the blood of the Messiah? Are you? Can you answer the question? Only you can answer that question if you've entered in to a covenant relationship through the blood of Jesus. As Anita taught, recognizing your own sin, recognizing the holiness of God, and asking God to forgive you. Only you can sign that document, so to speak. Only you. And you sign it by faith in the Messiah. You say, yes, Lord, I recognize who I am. I am a sinner. I need help. I need deliverance. I'm a dead man. I need to be raised to new life. Have mercy upon me. You recognize where to go. You recognize that the source is the Messiah, that Jesus came to this earth on a rescue mission, and that was for you and for me. Hallelujah. You sign that document by faith. Believing that what Jesus did in atoning for your sins was enough. It's not anything that you can add to. It's not Jesus plus being a good boy or being a good girl or going to church on Sunday or not eating this or not eating that. It's Jesus Christ and his blood shed on the cross for your sins. That's how come we can sing this song. I am in covenant relationship with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. In the chorus it goes, I'm justified. What does that mean? Well, some people say that uh, it means to be, to, to be declared innocent. Let's look at Romans 5 verse 1. Romans 5 verse 1 tells us this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, remember that's how you sign the document, or the covenant. That's why you bring yourself to walk through the blood of the covenant of Christ. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we've been justified by faith. And as I mentioned, some people think, that, or, or some Sometimes it's described justified. What does it mean? Just as if I never sinned. Well, the reality is this. You have sinned. And God declares you innocent. And so he takes that sin and throws it away into the deepest part of the sea. You know, hallelujah. As far as the east is from the west, you've been justified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you stand before God, and every person on this earth will stand before God, you as a believer, God say, okay, what do you got to say for yourself? Nothing, Lord, just that Jesus died for me. He will see the righteousness of his son upon you. If you say, oh, I was pretty good, you know, I gave money to the offering, and I, I uh, fasted on Fridays, only ate fish or whatever, he, he's going to say, well, Sorry, that's not it. There's only one way to the Father. There's only one God and one mediator to, through to God, and that is the man Christ Jesus. So it says that we're justified. I'm justified through faith. I'm sanctified. What in the world does that mean, sanctified? Me, I'm sanctified. Let's read in Hebrews uh, 9. Beginning in verse 11. Hebrews 9, verse 11. Hebrews 9 tells us this in verse 11. Hebrews 9, 11. But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, cleanse you, Stephen, from your your conscience, from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, He is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Everything was sanctified with blood in the Old Testament. All those sacrifices that they did, they had to sanctify everything. They'd sprinkle blood on everything. They'd splatter blood everywhere. They'd sprinkle it on you if you were in the, you know, congregation. They'd do it on the tabernacle. They'd do it on the the Torah. They'd they'd, uh, sprinkle it on the holy objects. You know, and uh, ultimately there's a sprinkling on, on uh, those who were part of, of that covenant. But Christ is the initiator, the author of a better covenant. That's what you find in Hebrews. You know, you have a, a better sacrifice, uh, a better covenant. You know, uh, Jesus shed his blood once. There's not that continuous shedding. And that is... For the sanctification of the people. Now in John 17, turn to the Gospel of John. John 17, beginning in verse 15. John 17, verse 15. Wow. Okay, there we go. John 17, verse 15. Jesus is speaking. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. This is Jesus speaking to his Father. You are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus sanctified himself through his blood. We are sanctified. And guess what? The Bible says that husbands are to read the Bible to their wives. It's like the washing of water of the, of the word. There is a sanctification that occurs when you read the Bible. There's a cleansing. There's a healing. There's an impartation. I want to submit to you that every time you open the Bible, wisdom is gained. You know, we ask for wisdom. We pray for wisdom. God wants to give us wisdom. Open the word and allow that sanctification process to be continued and uh, in your life. So I'm justified. I'm sanctified. I have peace with God through Jesus Christ, we read in Romans 5. I've been redeemed. What does that mean, to be redeemed? Bought back, and I want to include in that, bought back from what? From the slave market. That's the the nuance. Slavery has been a part of mankind's history from the get-go. Jesus has purchased us from the slave market of sin to set us free. You know, uh, Greg Pierce, who has come here and preached, he's an uh, evangelist from Arkansas. He tells the story. He comes from a family of uh, that had a big plantation in the South, in uh, Louisiana, I think it was, and uh, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful story. They treated their their workers as family members, and uh, you know. It wasn't the the scene that is often portrayed with whipping and abuse, although that was a huge part of it. And that is a huge part of slavery when you take someone's freedom and then you say, okay, now you are going to serve me. You're going to live a life of servitude. But he tells the story of going to this one spot in, it's either Louisiana and Mississippi, where the last public slave auction took place. And you can still go there. And you can still see the, the, the platform upon which these uh, men, women, and children would be taken up for everyone to uh, look at and like an animal and say, how much do you want to pay for this person? 
And the very last one that was sold, the very last slave to be sold in the United States was a young woman about 18 or 19 years old. And uh, I won't go into that whole story right now, but uh, what happened was a man bought her. And so she was this beautiful slave girl. And, of course, the sla- they were abused and taken in as concubines by the pla- uh, plantation owners. And he, he says, so now what are you going to do with her? And everybody's going, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? And he goes, I'm setting her free. I'm setting her free. And he sent her up from Louisiana up to New York to live with, with family members. And that was the last slave sold in the United States of America. Hey, we are all on that auction block, you know. We're slaves to sin until we surrender to Christ. And when we do and we say, God, you're the only one who can help me. Only you can buy me back and purchase me from this slave market. I've been redeemed, 1 Peter. Oh, I'm sorry. Galatians 3, 13. Okay, turn to Galatians 3.13. This is a really good one. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. As it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now listen to this, verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That is through the new covenant. The blessing of Abraham. Hallelujah. Now, 1 Peter 1. I'm going to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. It talks about how precious was that redemption. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. We've been bought from the slave market of sin through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now turn with me to Revelations 5. Revelations 5. Beginning in verse 8, you're going to like this. Revelation 5, verse 8. This is in the, the the holy place of heaven. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each having a harp and a golden and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. How about that? Our prayers go up into heaven and are, as it were, in a golden bowl full of incense, being lifted up. Incense being lifted up, going up into the heavens, are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and listen to this, and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Wow, is that beautiful. That's the end of the story right there. You know, that's our destination. Having been redeemed, bought with the blood of the Lamb, our destination is the throne of God Almighty to worship Him and to praise Him and give Him thanks forever and ever. I've been redeemed, our song said, made holy clean. This is the last part. I'm going to wrap it up. Made holy clean. Now I stand forgiven through the grace that's been given to me. You see, we live in the age of grace. And the the doors are wide open. Grace is receiving from God what we do not deserve. What don't we deserve? We don't deserve forgiveness. There's nothing we can do to earn it. All we can do is receive it. It tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, say it with me if you know it, for by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, 
lest any man should boast. It's a gift. You need to receive it. Have you received the gift from Jesus? Jesus is the gift. Have you received him? In Romans 5, verse 6, it says this. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength and in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. There was nothing we could do to perform CPR on our own selves. We needed to be resurrected into new life. Jesus Christ offers that new life. If you will receive it. In Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. Verse 13 tells us this. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He has made alive together with him. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. What is he talking about? That handwriting was a certificate of debt, indebtedness. We all have an indebtedness to God. All of our sins could be written on that note of indebtedness. And through Jesus Christ's sacrificial death on the cross, God has totally erased that certificate of indebtedness and made our forgiveness complete. You know, one of the things that we do when we walk with the cross, you know, on Good Friday, we have at the, uh, at the end of it, as we set up the cross, you know, we start at the Episcopal Church and then we walk, we, we pray and we have a meditation. And then every uh, few hundred meters, we stop and we hold the cross and we read a scripture about the blood of Jesus and how we've been forgiven. And then when we get to Havi, we put the cross up, you know, with concrete stakes. And then everyone is given a, a piece of paper to write. Whatever they need to write to God on, on that, you know, and to God, forgive me, forgive me for saying these things, forgive me for doing these things. And then we nail it to the cross. And then after that, we burn those, those notes. That's what God has done for you. He's taken it all. He said from the cross, it is finished. What did it mean? What do you mean? He said, it's complete. My mission's complete. I paid the price. Here's our closing scripture, if you can believe it. Okay. Here it is. Matthew 27. That, 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 uh, Matthew 27, beginning in verse 35. Matthew 27. Verse 35, Matthew 27, 35. Now, before I say this, that what, what Paul used in Colossians there, saying, having nailed it to the cross, we know that that is what they would nail on the cross of the felons and the people who committed crimes worthy of crucifixion. The Romans would put the crime above, at the top of the cross. Now, follow me here. As we close this, Matthew 27, beginning in verse 35. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And they put up over his head the accusation written against him. This is why Jesus was crucified. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. And those who passed by, by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. You know, when the Jews would wag their head, you know, they're walking by, and they're saying, Hey, if you really are the guy, come on down from the cross. They were mocking him. 
the king of glory. He was crucified, and his crime was claiming to be the king of the Jews. He was unjustly tried. He didn't really even have a fair trial. It wasn't a trial. He was tortured, and he died on the cross because that's who he is. He is the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews is a title for Messiah. Is he your Messiah? Is he your salvation? Have you entered in through the blood to be a partaker of the covenants of Israel in the new covenant? Are you born again? I pray that you are. Please don't take this communion table if you are not. But if you are, let this be a place of healing. Let this be a place of restoration. Let this be a place of confession. As you come and you receive the Lord's Supper, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for you, Stephen. My body broken, shed for you, Stephen. There's one cup. You'll take one cup, one bread. That's for you because his body was broken and his blood was shed for you. So as we've done in the past, we're just going to uh, invite you to come forward and receive the elements. You can either receive it right here and take it and have your time with God right here or take it back to your seat. Don't worry about the cups. There's a garbage can back here and one on the front. We'll, or you can just leave it uh, on your chair and we'll collect them. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you for your great mercy and grace revealed through your plan of redemption. And we thank you, Father, that you provided what was needed to satisfy the wrath that you have towards all sin. Lord, thank you for the blood of your Son who cleanses us, who, who pushes us back, purchases us from the slave market and sets us free. Thank you, Father. We invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us as we take your supper this morning. And we remember what you did for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. So please come as the Lord leads. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, the Word of God reads, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good, good works. You know, we're going to uh, just break with our tradition of singing right now. Uh, I'm going to pronounce the benediction taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's peace be with you, and mahalo for being here.